Okay, hi, Intro to Philosophy. Um, what we are at here is the end. This is the end. Um, it, we are uh, discussing the final section test, and um, I'm reminding you to do those forms. Do them, do them, do them, do them, do them, because uh, they're worth uh, basically a full letter grade of um, your final grade for the course. That's 10% of your final grade. So it turns A's into B's or B's into A's, depending how you look at it, right? So there's some grades there. Um, these forms uh, close at exactly the same moment as the due date for this final section test, which is December 13th um, at 11.55 p.m. That's five minutes to midnight. All right. Um, so you should be pretty um, pretty used to um, these these tests by this point. So I'm not going to spend a ton, ton of time going through the boilerplate. Um, I talk about what the tests are. That's straight from the syllabus. Um, missed assignments, you can let me know. Um, one thing I should, uh, because extensions are a conversation. Um, one thing I should say about this um, is that I have a breakneck kind of turnaround time on this um, this assignment. So uh, with regard to uh, what I'm able to offer in terms of an extension, it's going to be very limited because Oakland University gives me 48 hours to turn your final grades in after um, this assignment comes in. So um, get them in on time. It, do your level best. I've got very little wiggle room with regard to this. So if something does happen, contact me and I'll work with you to the extent I'm able. So that makes sense. Um, assignment submission, make sure I've got it. Make sure it's the right document. Um, email it to me if you're not sure. Um, you know, basically, you're, you, you, yeah, that's, that's self-explanatory and plagiarism, don't do it. Just don't. Um, at this point in the course, you should know that policy <coughs> very well. <laughs> so, um, uh, the readings, uh, uh, Kierkegaard, Concept of Anxiety and Sickness Unto Death, um, at Nietzsche, Portable Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols, and um, only a limited just up to the end of morality is anti-nature. Um, video material, all of this video material you're responsible for, it's required course content, so screen it, screen it, um, in addition to my videos, all of the other videos. Um, and uh, short answer questions, two paragraphs each bare minimum, um, uh, I define what that is, full sentences, five points each, total of 30 points. All right. Um, this should hopefully be fairly straightforward, except that this material should make you sort of dizzy. In fact, the first question has to do uh, with Kierkegaard and, quote, the dizziness of freedom. Kierkegaard introduces anxiety as, quote, the dizziness of freedom and as something that arises as a result of human beings being qualified as spirit. Right? What does he mean by this? So you've got two things to unpack there. Right? One, um, uh, the dizziness of freedom. The podcasts actually do a really good job of introducing this notion of freedom. Um, and in my videos, I tried to unpack spirit somewhat, right? We are that we care. We're dispositions, right? Um, so uh, essentially what you're doing is unpacking those two kind of claims, right? Um, so five points for that. Yeah. Question number two with Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard concludes um, our selection of the concept of anxiety by suggesting uh, that a qualitative leap is necessary to overcome anxiety. What is meant by a qualitative leap and in what sense can it overcome anxiety? What does he mean by a qualitative leap? Leap um, it means a leap of faith, right? How does that overcome anxiety? Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I did a fair job on my videos of actually going a step past belief um, and when talking about faith. Faith is a step past belief, right? It's trust to a certain extent, right? So um, essentially uh, what you have to do is um, relate those to this notion 
of anxiety. Then, um, question number three, uh, we are on to sickness unto death, and despair is a sickness unto death, right? That's what it is, it's despair. Um, Kierkegaard discusses two sorts of despair, quote, in a strict sense, right? Um, they are uh, not to will to be oneself, and in despair to will to be oneself, right? Briefly discuss each. All right, so introduce each of them, all right? distinguish in between them, all right? and noting the respects in which they are structurally similar. All right? um, so uh, despair, not, not will to be oneself, um, I liken to sort of a Charlie Brown, oh good grief, why me kind of despair, right? where you just, you know, you're sick of the look of yourself in the mirror, or something along those lines, versus despair to will to be oneself. Um, there's a great passage that, um, that Kierkegaard introduces in terms of this. It is, do, 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 um, uh, let me see, on page 355, in despairing over something, he really despaired over himself, and now he wants to be rid of himself. For example, when the ambitious man, whose slogan is either Caesar or nothing, does not get to be Caesar, he despairs over it. But it also means something else. Precisely because he did not get to be Caesar, he, cannot, uh, he na uh, now cannot bear to be himself. Consequently, he does not despair because he does not get to be Caesar, but because, uh, but he uh, despairs over himself because he did not get to be Caesar, right? So, effectively, what Kierkegaard is saying is that it, dialectically, uh, despair to will to be oneself, I want to be the kind of person who blah, 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 right, is despair not to will, to be oneself, right? Uh, they're structurally, they're just removed dialectically by, by one sort of inference, right? So when I despair to be, uh, will to, uh, uh, despair to not will to be myself, right? I, just, I can't look at myself anymore. I'm sick of the sight of myself. I don't want to be me anymore, right? When I, I'm in despair to will to be oneself, I want to be a smarter, faster, different, funnier, more effective version of myself, but it's still despair because every time I encounter myself as not that self, I despair with the encounter with myself. So it's effectively, right, structurally the same, right? They are, however, distinct dialectically, right? So um, that's, that's what I want to manage, you to manage there. I know Kierkegaard's tough, right? Um, just show me what you know here, right? Now, Nietzsche, Twilight of the Idols, or how one philosophizes with a hammer. Um, three questions there. In Twilight of the Idols, in section two of the problem of Socrates, Nietzsche makes the following claim. One must by all means stretch out one's fingers and make the attempt to grasp this amazing finesse that the value of life cannot be estimated. What does Nietzsche mean by this? Right. This is the point in Twilight of the Idols where he's talking about the value value judgments about life, right? What they actually show, right? So um, the full passage, which you will find um, boo -boo -boo -boo, on your page. 474, the consensus of the sages, I comprehend this even more clearly, proves least of all that they were right in all they agreed on. It shows rather that they themselves, these wisest men, agreed in some physiological respect and hence adopted the same negative attitude towards life, had to adopt it. Judgments, judgments against, uh, uh, judgments of value concerning life for it or against it can, in the end, never be true. They have value only as symptoms. They're worthy of consideration only as symptoms. In themselves, such judgments are stupidities. One must, by all, mean, uh, by all means, stretch out one's fingers, blah, 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 right? 
Effectively, um, there's a similarity to uh, the, what Nietzsche is asserting uh, and what Kierkegaard is asserting. Effectively, anxiety and despair. Anxiety, it's the dizziness of freedom wherein we flee from our freedom, right? In despair, it's a sickness of spirit insofar as we are failing to will ourselves and our lives. Effectively, this critique of Nietzsche's is doing the same thing. Judgments, judgments about life, negative judgments about life especially, are neither true nor false, but rather they show something about us. They show negative judgments about life are symptomatic of a, a sickness of spirit, effectively. That's, that's what Nietzsche's arguing here. Right. So, when I judge about life, oh, life sucks, right? I haven't told you something about life, I've told you something about myself, right? That's where Nietzsche's going with this. Question five, I asked you a Roderick question. <coughs> Roderick, while discussing the paradox of interpretation raised uh, by Nietzsche, claims, quote, it's crucially important for in the political economy of the university to try to deny and Nietzsche's insight for this reason, if it is one. Rick Roderick, Nietzsche, myth, is, uh, myth and myth maker, 91. Briefly discuss this issue. Now, this is the point where he's talking about um, interpretation, uh, the possibility of getting to a right interpretation. You see, it's related to the first kind of question in Nietzsche. In Nietzsche, he's saying that these interpretations themselves are assertions and symptoms, right? They, they show something about the spirit of the one making uh, the, the assertion. Now, effectively what Roderick's pointing out that is that, you know, when I stand behind my podium and uh, make my interpretation of Nietzsche and you take notes and that sort of thing, effectively, right, my interpretation is as good by Nietzsche's position as your interpretation or as anybody else's interpretation. It's impossible to get to the right interpretation. Right? Nietzsche is suggesting, and Roderick along with Nietzsche is suggesting something else, something different going on in the interpretive act. Right? So um, what I want you to do is evaluate that position stemming from Roderick on the basis of what you understand of Nietzsche. So. Um, that is your goal there. And then finally, question number six. In Twilight of the Idols, in the section called Morality is Anti-Nature, Nietzsche presents a rather damning criticism of Christian morality, claiming that it's a form of uh, morality that turns hostily against the passions, or is an attempt to kill the passions. He likens it to castration. Here. The alternative Nietzsche proposes is the spiritualization of the passions. That's, I, I get that quotation from 487 um, of Portable Nietzsche, uh, for which he gives us two examples, love and hostility. Briefly discuss how Nietzsche uses these passions as examples, love and hostility as examples of triumph over the prevailing form of morality. You see, this is Nietzsche's whole move, right? Effectively, the values that are being espoused by this dominant form of cultural belief are anti-natural. How are they anti-natural? Well, they turn hostility against the instincts and the passions. The passions speak in the name of life, right? They, they, they express a will to to, to live, right? So effectively, right, the two passions that have squeaked under the radar, right, are love and hostility. In some translations, it's enmity, right? He uses these two passions, right, as passions that we have, as he points out, thought through, right, um, at the beginning of that section, morality is anti-nature, um, I'm past it here, 486, right? Um, first section of morality is anti-nature. All passions have a phase when they're merely disastrous, when they drag their victim down, uh, down their victim, um, with the weight of stupidity. 
and later, very much later, a phase when they wed the spirit, when they spiritualize themselves formally. In view of the element of stupidity, in passion, war was declared on passion itself. Its destruction was plotted. All the old moral monsters are agreed on this, one must kill the passions. From the most famous formulation of this, he cites the um, New Testament right, kind of thing. Right? Um, so effectively, what he winds up arguing is that at later, a much later phase, right, we hit a point where we were able to think through the passions rather than, like a dentist, pluck out a tooth simply because it hurts. Right? So um, what's going on there and how does Nietzsche use these two passions as triumphs over the prevailing form of morality that would turn hostily against the passions? Love is a good example. Right? It's one that we engaged with early on in this course. Wherein, yes, love is stupid. It's effectively what um, Nietzsche is criticizing here is Lysias' position. You should avoid the lover. Right? Versus, right, the later Platonic position where you have to actually exercise some self-mastery in order to rein in the stupidity of your desire in order to let beauty shine through and blah, 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 etc., etc. Now, you don't get that metaphysics in Nietzsche, right? But what you do get is um, a case for a form of self-mastery, right? and allowing us to think through and harness the power of these life-affirming passions. Right. So, um, that is your test. Five points each, um, two paragraphs minimum each, uh, December 13th at five minutes to midnight. Uh, if you have any questions, I have one more set of office hours. So uh, please do stop by, avail yourself to those, and um, I look forward to reading uh, what you've written. And thank you for an interesting semester. Do the forums. Do them. All right. Have good days, one for each of you.